It's Canadian Prepper here back again with your daily dose of the Prepper News where we condense all of the unfortunate events of the day into one convenient little 30 minute bite sized package for your consumption. Now let's just break it all down. We're going to summarize and we're going to do a deep dive. So in summary, we have Europe declaring Russia a state sponsor of terrorism, which is likely a precursor to World War III. You see the Europeans and the Americans are hoping for regime change. That's what they're banking on when the Russian economy collapses. Unfortunately, what they're likely going to get is nuclear Armageddon. We're also going to talk about German defense minister advising the population to stockpile food and water for at least 10 days while they do an overhaul on their civil defense structures and shelters. We're also going to talk about the comical levels of media collusion ado with the nuclear power plant situation in Ukraine. It's just getting cartoonish in uh, the levels of ridiculousness there. We're also going to talk about Poland putting German Patriot missiles along the border with Ukraine. That's a pretty big escalation and slow creep into the war. We have Serbia and Kosovo who could literally go to war any second now. We have Ukraine making claims that Russia is planning to attack Belarus nuclear power plant, one of their new nuclear power plants, and blame it on the Ukrainians in a false flag attack in an attempt to bring the Belarusians directly into the war, even though they're pretty much uh, abetting the Russians in every possible way right now. We have 3 million Ukrainians at least in addition to the already 7 million that have emigrated from the country. Uh, another 3 million are expected to migrate to Europe this year due to the failing critical infrastructure and power grid which is leaving many in the dark. People are going to be relying on alternative means to keep themselves warm. We have Iran that's on the brink of civil war. If that flares up, the entire Middle East gets destabilized and the price of oil goes parabolic. We also have the EU hoarding Russian diesel ahead of the coming oil price cap that's going to be imposed by Europe on Russian oil in December. But the good news is that the FDA has deemed lab-grown chicken safe to eat. Yes, it is coming. Lab-grown chicken is officially on its way. And this is coincident with the worst bird flu outbreak on record spanning many continents and a very ominous sign that perhaps the worst pandemic has yet to come. Now, let's just break this all down. You're probably wondering why the hell I'm LARPing around the studio here with the tent. Once again, this is a different tent. This is a white duck tent. These are like military grade canvas uh, heavy duty style tents these are built for like semi-permanent installations this is not something you're probably going to throw on your back unless you're with a big party of people who one guy can be the pack mule to carry it but this is a very thick heavy duty canvas there's lots of benefits and drawbacks to canvas the only real drawback is the weight uh, the benefit is that it's thick it has better heat retention qualities. It's far more durable. So if you get sparks flying out of your chimney, it's not going to uh, burn through like it would with a sill nylon. And uh, it's just cozier. It's more organic, it's more natural, but these are built incredibly durably. White duck tents are just second to none in terms of the durability of uh, the canvas and the materials that they use. So we're gonna, we always set up the tents first before we take them out to the field to test them out. And guys at CanadianPreparedness.com, our whole mission is to get you the gear that you need, nothing more, nothing less, premium quality stuff that is gonna last a lifetime. So go and check it out. Now, let's talk about Europe declaring Russia a state sponsor of terrorism and what the implications are going to be there. Well, essentially, that's like declaring war on Russia without declaring war on Russia. I mean, you're basically saying that Russia is sponsoring malvalent acts against other countries that you deem to be allies. And uh, that can't end well. I mean, this is a sign that things are escalating for the worse. Resolution 479 was passed. However, it is not binding, meaning that NATO members don't necessarily have to follow through with any of the implications of this designation. But what it typically will mean is more sanctions on Russia in an attempt to cripple their economy, and it also means more sanctions on countries that are going to trade with Russia. So the goal is to try to pressure all other countries who are currently still trading with Russia to suspend that trade with the hopes that they can collapse 
the Russian economy and then essentially force regime change. That's what they're banking on because Europe still thinks it's the center of the universe and this place with 5 billion people called Asia and Africa don't exist and aren't going to provide a viable market for what the Russians have to offer. And even if they were to bring forth regime change, which is highly unlikely, I mean, this sanction um, regimen hasn't been successful anywhere else in the world ever bringing forth regime change. It's only emboldened the authoritarian leaders in these countries even more. And in many cases, you know, it's, it's generated more support for the leaders. Um, what it could potentially lead to if Putin does feel threatened is, of course, the use of nuclear weapons, which I think is right around the corner. Germany has advised their population, this is from their defense minister, to stockpile several crates of water and canned food at least for 10 days. Now, this is primarily due to the energy shortages, which are, of course, due to the lack of Russian natural gas, which is partly due to Nord Stream being rendered inoperable because, of course, as we all know, the Russians like to destroy their own infrastructure. A little bit of sarcasm there. I mean, you know, it's not every day that a $20 billion one-of-a-kind pipeline just gets blown up by the country that engineered it, you know, just for S and giggles. Anyways, they are concerned that even though their reservoirs of natural gas are currently full, that they're quickly going to be diminished and that there will be shortages. They are, just like the rest of the Europeans, banking on regime change, which is why I think, which is why I think that they're trying to, that they're hoping that maybe these pipelines will get turned on again, or at least the one working one, I believe it's one of the Nord Stream 2 pipelines is still operational. They're hoping that that's going to get turned on perhaps uh, under a, a different regime, or maybe uh, the Baral Russia will be balkanized and, you know, that part of Russia, that, like around the Leningrad region, will be severed from the rest of the country. Who knows what they're banking on? But uh, they're banking on the Russian uh, Federation basically collapsing. They've also advised uh, their, their country to prepare emergency shelters and civil protections. They're saying that they're not expecting conventional hostilities on German soil, but if a war is fought in neighboring countries, the lives of Germans will be impacted. Now recall that Poland has been doing this very thing for the last few months, and now, of course, this is expanding outwards towards Germany as they had that close brush with the Russians there on the, well, so they say it was actually apparently a Ukrainian S-300, although I'm not entirely convinced of that, okay? There is a possibility, as I've always said, there's a possibility that maybe it was a Russian missile and NATO didn't want to admit that it was because to admit that it was would require them to respond in kind. But I'm still leaning 90% to the fact that this was probably a errant uh, uh, Ukrainian S-300. Okay, surface to air missile. Anyways, not looking good. Uh, we also, and this is kind of the main story of today, is that we're, we're reaching comical levels of collusion on part of the Western media with respect to this nuclear power plant situation in Zaporozhia. Now, what you need to understand is this, is that the Russians have complete control of the nuclear power plant. And it's really divided, it's separated by a river. So there's not one inch of this nuclear power plant which is being controlled by the Ukrainians. So the notion that the Russians are shelling it themselves is just asinine, okay? It's stupid. And even though the Russians are using it as a shield, they're putting their weapons there and shooting, which leaves the Ukrainians, in some cases, no choice but to shell it. Like, I mean, if you are being shelled by an army who's hiding behind a nuclear power plant, you have no choice. You can't just continuously be shelled. You have to respond in some way, and that usually means that you need to surgically target in and around the reactors and the spent fuel pools and all the, the uh, spent fuel in order to minimize the risk of a radiological event. But instead of saying that, instead of just admitting the reality of the situation, the media makes stupid headlines like this. 
This is one of the funniest ones. Russia shelling at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. That was one of the, the titles of one of the articles. Russia shelling at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. What does that mean, Russia shelling at? Well, that means that Russia is shelling at, but they're not saying that the Russians are shelling the nuclear power plant because they know that's dumb and they know the truth about that's going to come out soon. Um, they also say close call in shelling near nuclear reactor on Ukrainian front line. <laughs> and then the UN says, whoever is doing this needs to stop. So instead of just admitting the Russians are playing dirty by using the nuclear power plant as a shield and the Ukrainians are trying to take out their artillery or whatever they have there, their missile defense or whatever they got there in order to, to win the war. Um, instead of that, they, you know, they're very ambiguous about the, their condemnations of this thing, not pinning you know, it on one side or the other when they, they know who's doing it. Okay. Now, I think there was around 30 projectiles that hit uh, this nuclear power plant over the weekend. And the risk here is that the nuclear fuel could overheat if power to the cooling systems is cut or if the nuclear fuel itself is cut. Now the risk to the actual reactors is quite low. For starters, they are turned off, but they're also shielded by several feet of concrete. So penetrating these, even with bombs, so I'm told, would be very difficult unless you, you know, you use like a Moab style bomb on it. Um, the Russians are claiming that's being attacked by NATO 155 millimeter howitzers and they're saying that the, this is the Western media uh, giving Ukraine carte blanche to do whatever they want in the conflict. This, of course, comes on the heels of those videos that were released over the weekend showing Russian prisoners seemingly being shot by uh, Ukrainian soldiers while, um, while surrendering, although it's not conclusive really with respect to what happened there because the video just cuts out. Isn't that always so convenient how we're always on a razor's edge you know it's always there's always that um uh, there's always a bit of doubt when it comes to these things you know it couldn't just be that they let the tape play for an extra three seconds so we know definitively what happened it has to be this thing now where there's uh it's dubious with respect to what happens but i guess nothing is that easy uh ukraine or sorry the un claims it doesn't have the ability to identify who's beyond the attacks i mean they have their they have inspectors there who have inspected the place they clearly could ascertain who is doing this if they really wanted to regardless this could be potentially um why they are evacuating different cities around that region. Uh, part of the reason why they evacuated Kyrgyzstan and Mykolaiv is because the power infrastructure there has been completely gutted. There is no electricity in Kyrgyzstan anymore. It's essentially a ghost town now, and it's just going to be a battle zone. So, but I think, you know, there may be some preparation for some sort of radiological event in this region. And uh, the Ukrainians right now are trying to penetrate deeper and all go all the way to Crimea, you know, before the year's end. That's what they're saying, even though Mark Milley claims that they're probably not going to be able to do anything of the sort. Um, nonetheless, the campaign must go on, I guess. Uh, Poland is going to be putting German Patriot missiles on the border with Ukraine. And uh, this, is, this is kind of like your phased approach to entering the conflict. This is mission creep in its finest example in that now these Patriot missile systems being on the border with Poland, if Russia continues to strike that deep into Western Ukraine, it's only a matter of time before they get close to Lviv or maybe even close to these supply lines coming across the border, that one of these Patriot missile systems miscalculates, intercepts a Russian missile, and uh, then there's a big conversation right away, or even intercepts a Russian fighter jet or a Russian bomber or something like that, which of course would be an immediate escalation to, uh, to war. Uh, we have Serbia and Kosovo on the brink of war. Now, these, this conflict in and of itself 
compared to the scale and scope of the Ukraine war would be relatively small considering either of these countries only have armies in the thousands, uh, maybe around 10,000 soldiers, 10 to 15,000 at least. That's to the best of my knowledge, according to Wikipedia. And uh, But it would be a conflict. It would be another war. And it's just a sign that, you know, tensions are rising all around the world as economic stress and uh, energy stress starts to bear down on people. Then tensions are going to ultimately rise and these Dividing lines are going to become more pronounced. Alexander Vucic warns that Kosovo could turn to hell on earth if they don't reverse a plan to ban Serbian license plates. So, it, it, you know, it just starts with small things like that when you're looking at these small territorial battles uh, between countries with populations in the single-digit millions. But once again, it's just, it's just more potential for the war to spill over into a greater Europe. If anything, this is really, you know, this is the result of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine in some way, shape, or form. You know, it's all related because the tensions uh, between the Serbs and Kosovo have increased as a result of Serbia's support or tacit support of Russia and they're continuing to get uh, energy from Russia and their, their reluctance to sanction Russia. We also have Ukraine claiming Russia is planning an attack on the Belarusian nuclear power plant. Now again, is this just something you put forward in an attempt to absolve yourself of responsibility? Were you to actually perpetuate that yourself? It's hard to say, but the Russians, according to the Ukrainians, were going to attack the Belarusian nuclear power plant, blame it on the Ukrainians in the hopes that that would garner more support for the war from the Belarusians and have the Belarusians directly enter the conflict. Now, as far as I know, the Belarusian army is pretty small. And, you know, they are abetting the Russians as much as they possibly can without, you know, directly engaging in the war. They're launching missiles from there. They've launched offenses from there. So they're basically already in the war short of their, you know, tens of thousands of guys or how many, ever many, you know, active military they have not actually crossing the border which Russia probably doesn't want anyways because they need them guarding that territory because there is also concern that, you know, the Ukrainians could go into Belarus at some point or which is probably unlikely because they have mined their border. They've blown all the bridges up in hopes of preventing the Belarusians from coming over. But it might be an attempt, according to the Ukrainians, to rope them more directly into the conflict and get more support for the war. Speaking of support for the war, when you see things happen, um, like happened over the weekend, whatever the, the result of the investigation is, uh, for which there probably really won't be a meaningful one, and even if it is, it's going to be skewed uh, by you know, whoever is conducting it. And usually that means that the Russians are going to get the short end of the stick. I'm not saying that, you know, they didn't bring this on themselves by going to war in Ukraine and sending guys there in the first place. But a great way to, you know, galvanize your enemy and his civilian population against you is to do things like that, is to shoot people who are allegedly surrendering. So all that does is that just generates more support for the conflict. Just like what happened in Vietnam, where every time you went to a village and you took out, you know, uh, uh, some Viet Cong or you killed some innocent civilians, all of their relatives then will hate you, right? All of their relatives will have it in for you. And the Russians are facing the same problem there in Ukraine is that every civilian they kill, you know, they create two or three more combatants who are related to that person. So this is why, this is why it's very important if you're conducting a special military operation like this, that you try to minimize civilian casualties because you know then the prospect for guerrilla warfare in the future, once you do every, eventually lock everything down, is going to be very, very high if you've pissed a lot of people off. According to the UN, the Ukrainians are going to see the migration of another 3 million people this winter, and that is only if there is no more bombardment on critical infrastructure by the Russians. I have a sneaking suspicion that that number is going to be much higher, and I don't know how they're going to calculate that number is that going to include people who have the means and have the, the resources 
to basically exit the country and aren't going to be on one of these uh, migrant caravans, people who are going to have the resources to, you know, actually um, get out of the country and maybe they're not going to be counted or included. It's very difficult to say exactly how many people have vacated the country. Right now, I'm sure there's not a very accurate census uh, taking that's, that's taking place. Now, this is a funny one. I got a kick out of this. <laughs> According to Timothy Ash, who's an economist for Newsweek, very unbiased source, Newsweek, that's sarcasm, USAID is saving the USA billions of dollars. Now, we have said before that the USA saves billions of dollars on this conflict because it, every war that the US has partaken in is all about propping up the petrodollar. That's what it's all, it, ultimately that's what it's all about. And that's worth quadrillions, arguably. So yes, you know, in comparison to quadrillions, putting up a hundred billion or two to Zelensky isn't a very big deal, right? But here's what he says. He says that this pales in comparison to the entire US budget, which is 725 billion, our 60 billion contribution he says. So, you know, I mean, it, it's a small amount compared to a hundred bazillion dollars, you know, it's only one bazillion dollars, right? So it's no big deal. And then he also says, if Russia is defeated, it will be worth it. But here's the thing, you know, Russian nuclear doctrine basically dictates that before defeat, nuclear Armageddon will ensue. So this is lunacy. He makes no mention about that because they're very flippant about the prospect of nuclear war. They want people to just forget about that. They hope that they can contain the whole thing and that Russia is going to take it on their back and that they're going to allow their economy to be completely destroyed and allow their a long time leader to be dethroned and just have the country balkanized in, and broken up and uh, essentially destroyed. And they're not going to do anything about it. They're not going to use the their most powerful weapon at their disposal which is nuclear weapons and i mark my words before you see regime change in russia before you see um any sort of uh you know capitulation on the part of the russians there will be at least one tactical nuke used he says that it's a bargain for regime change it's a great opportunity to destroy our main adversary with no boots on the ground he says so it's a win-win we don't die the ukrainians die <laughs> it's unbelievable how some of these economists think. Um, Iran is on the brink of civil war. According to, uh, this is a more objective number. Some people are saying 15,000 people were killed. I mean, that's just ridiculous. This is from a Western news source. This one I think is a bit more accurate. 378 people have been killed already, including 47 children and 27 women. Now, I don't know exactly how they're calculating that number, of people, protesters who've been killed. This is a big amount, and I do think that this is a very big concern for the, the leadership there, although I don't think they're close to necessarily losing their grip on things. I don't think this is at like uh, a threat level yet where they're, they're worried about an actual coup and a overthrow of the government. I mean, they're still doing a lot of business. It's not like the country's in total anarchy. Yes, there are riots, there are protests, there are people shooting at the uh, Iranian military and the police, but it's still mostly under control. But if this region becomes destabilized, on top of all the other problems we have now, there's a lot of, you know, cheerleaders, the same people who are, you know, your, your run-of-the-mill, you know, change the avatar to blue and yellow and, you know, pro-Ukraine everything, are the ones who are now cheering this on. And they have no idea what's going to happen if you have a destabilized Iran which descends into civil war. I mean, the amount of uh, terrorism and conflict and instability that will ensue in all of these surrounding countries that Iran has its tentacles in, and it is going to be, is going to push us over the edge in terms of oil prices and energy prices because the Strait of Hormuz is going to be screwed you know, that it's likely going to lead to Iran going to war with other countries, because just like Putin, although they don't have a military, uh, although they don't have a nuclear doctrine, because they don't officially have nuclear weapons, although some people suspect they already do, which is why they haven't been invaded yet, they will not go down quietly. They will not go down silently. 
Okay, if they sense that there are other countries within the region meddling in their affairs, trying to usurp power, they will take action, proactive action. Um, there was a situation where two Russian fighter jets flew over NATO ships in the Baltic, 73 meters overhead, okay? And their pilots did not respond despite repeated attempts by the crews of ships to communicate, the command of NATO forces said in a statement. So clearly, this was just another message being sent. It's all about sending messages at this point in time. Russia and Iran have reached an agreement to begin building drones in Russia, leveraging whatever Iranian technology the Russians require to do so. This just all points towards a further deepening of the Russian-Iranian alliance. And at the same time, and this is a sign that things are getting real bad, is that Israel is saying that if they go through with this thing with Iran and they start uh, importing long-range ballistic missiles or medium-range ballistic, I can't remember which ones they're planning on getting from Iran, but if they say if they do this, then Israel's going to start sending weapons to Ukraine, and then it's official, the dividing line has been set. Of course, Israel has been reluctant because they do have some positive relations with the Russians. Obviously, historically, you know, the Russians liberated the camps, and everybody always forgets about that. And, uh, you know, everybody, you could say that, oh, it was just by happenstance or whatever. And there was a lot of other atrocities committed by the Russians when they went into Germany. I get that. But, you know, I mean, look at how many Russians died in Operation Barbarossa, you know. So I think they had a right to be a little pissed. But with respect to Israel, you know, they should, in theory, be quite supportive of uh, Russia at least insofar as they helped them out in World War II. But they're saying that that is a rather tenuous relationship in light of their alliance with the Iranians, who, of course, are the Israelis' arch enemy. We have a railroad strike deal which has been rejected. However, only 51% voted nay. So they just got, I think it was like 50.6% voted nay. So really they need like a few guys to come over to the other side and the deal will be approved. But if it cannot, then that means that in two weeks, right before Christmas, conveniently on December 9th, there could be a major strike which could lead to some major supply chain issues costing the United States $2 billion per day Goods such as agricultural products, crude oil, vehicle grains, uh, vehicles, grains, chemicals, and consumer goods would not be flowing, which of course would not bode well for Christmas shopping season. Um, we have Russia, who's vowing down to vowing to hunt down the Ukrainians responsible for the alleged killing of Russian prisoners. Again, like I said, all this is going to do is increase Russian civilian support for the war effort and get people uh, voluntarily signing up to the military. On a positive note, Russia and the USA plan on holding New START talks, although I think that this is largely symbolic and likely to go nowhere because one of the stipulations is going to be that there is an inspection regime that is part of this deal where either side can go and inspect what the other side is doing with their nuclear arsenal. And I just can't see that happening while the United States is in a proxy war with Russia. Of course, the whole goal of this is arms control to limit the amount of uh, warheads and missiles and bombers that are currently being deployed at any given moment. And of course, uh, the ultimate goal of non-proliferation and a reduction in the amount of nuclear warheads that exist, so to minimize the threat of global thermal nuclear annihilation. We have the EU hoarding Russian diesel before the ban comes into effect. So there's been a 126% increase in diesel shipments since October, 215,000 barrels per day. So they are fretting the diesel shortage. And Russia remains the largest diesel supplier to Europe. So Think about this. Maybe this is partly why the price of diesel is so high because the Europeans are stockpiling it. But they're now going to have to secure up to 500 to 600,000 uh, barrels of diesel per day to replace what the Russians were able to supply them. That means that that's going to dig into everybody else's supply. Now, obviously, the Russians are going to find a market 
for their diesel. It's going to go somewhere and it's going to be laundered and, you know, they'll pump it into another ship or whatever they, they do to uh, bypass sanctions when these countries do that, like I read. But nonetheless, that means that our already high diesel prices are likely to skyrocket even further. This leads to increased shipping costs, real material diesel shortages, which of course has a substantial impact on the supply chain because everything runs on diesel, including boats, including cargo ships and all the rest. Now the FDA, and this is the good news for the day, guys. The FDA has deemed lab-grown chicken safe to eat. Yay! 50,000 pounds of this stuff are going to be churned out every year by the Upside Foods Company, who has their new patented animal cell culture technology, where they use gene-edited cells to produce meat in a lab. Now, this hasn't been fully approved, but they've passed the first three of the first, which is the most difficult of three regulatory steps. So this is how they're going to combat bird flu. Now, supposedly it's been criticized because one of the other things they're talking about is, well, you know, carbon footprint, yada, yada, yada. And uh, it's been criticized because apparently it takes a lot more energy than it does to raise a chicken. But of course, they're going to say, well, that's just now. And then later on, they're going to improve it. But I don't know if I'm biting down on this, literally. <laughs> um, I know there's going to be some people, you know, they're going to have their 10th their jab and they're going to be lining up um, at the doors to be the first ones to try this lab-grown meat. But myself personally, I don't know. I'm a little uh, suspicious. I'm a little, I, I think I'm going to pass. But, you know, eventually this might be all we have to eat. This is probably going to, you know, if there is an irradiated wasteland like Judge Dredd and there's no more outside and you can only grow food inside. This is probably going to be how the elites get their food. Actually, the elites are going to have their underground chicken coops. But I guess we'll be uh, fighting over the cell cultures. So on the topic of bird flu, I'm going to be doing a dedicated video on this because I don't think this is getting enough attention. It's reaching very, very scary levels of prevalence in the population. You're talking about the worst blue bird flu outbreak on record in the UK. The, it, there's more states that have seen bird flu this year than ever before, twice the amount uh, than was found in the record year, which was 2014. And we also have it complete uh, spreading in Canada at a completely different scale, according to uh, the British Columbia veterinarian uh, association or whoever it is that assesses this stuff. So not looking good. And <laughs> lo and behold, they're still doing gain of function research on bird flu. At least that's, that's the extent of the information that I have so far. Don't take that to the bank. We're going to clarify it all in a more deep dive that we do in the future. But guys, keep on prepping. And, uh, we got some good uh, outdoor style videos coming out for you. We are you know, trying to get out there and test ourselves at the same time because that's most important. It's, it's important that you don't just sit here and listen to bad news all day. You actually go out and you learn your skills. We've got a lot of big videos coming up and planned. And I would encourage you, you know, one of the best gifts for Christmas are socks. These are the socks I wear every day for the last uh, God knows how many years. These are the Darn Tough Hunt. Darn Tough has a lifetime warranty on their socks, a lifetime warranty. Now the Hunt version is, in my opinion, one of the most durable versions. But we also have a lighter weight Hike version, which is maybe, you know, if you don't want as thick of a sock, but you still want that lifetime warranty and durability. And uh, these are Merino wool, so they're incredibly warm. And we also have the Tactical version, okay? So that's another very durable, and these things are antimicrobial, they're moisture wicking, they're flame resistant. And I could be lying to myself about this, but of all the socks I've used, these ones stink the least. Not that my feet stink, because my feet don't stink, right? Um, at least that's, that's what I think, not according to significant others. Uh, apparently that's, that's not true. But uh, yeah, go get yourself some darn tough socks, CanadianPreparedness.com. We got all makes and models of those. And we also have Fall Raven. Fjall Raven is a Scandinavian company. I'm not sure if it's Norwegian or Swedish or what, but Fjall Raven makes some of the finest 
bushcrafter pants and apparel that is on the market. We have that in pretty much every other big name uh, manufacturer of preparedness products under the sun, CanadianPreparedness.com. One stop shop and we ship it all in house. None of that drop shopping e commerce BS, that e commerce swindler BS. We shop, we sell everything out of our warehouse here. So if you have problems, you contact us and we resolve it. Okay, guys, you take care of yourself. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the video and let me know what your comments are in the comment section below with respect to all of the events of the last 24. Take care, guys.